Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and I can't help but begin by drawing attention to the fact that, yet again, the government house leader rose in this house a few minutes ago and sought unanimous consent to rush through another government bill. And, of course, he failed to get unanimous consent. And then he served notice that he that the government intends to bring in, uh, no, it will, is serving notice that it will, it will bring in time allocation. And I'd point out that that will be the 46th time that it's happened with this government, which is a record of all governments. And, and I, I want to bring this out because, because it's 11 o'clock at night, we're sitting till midnight, um, we're debating legis legislation that has been sitting around for years. Um, this particular bill that we're debating tonight, S10, is one uh, such example. And so it's really quite extraordinary that we have this government that is so contemptuous of democratic practice. You know, we're here as parliamentarians to uphold democratic practice for our constituents and for all Canadians. That's what we do in this place, is we debate legislation. And I, I consider it an affront to all members of parliament, but particularly the opposition, because our job is to analyze legislation, it's to scrutinize, and it's to hold the government to account. That's the basis of our parliamentary democracy. And so to see the government time and time and time again, without purpose and without rational reason, but for political reasons, rush through legislation, cut off debate, legitimate debate in this, in this House is deeply disturbing. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I just wanted to begin my remarks because it's become so routine that we now come back into ha in the House during the day, interrupting committees, other business, to vote on these time allocations. And I think even we ourselves forget um, just how, how sickening it is in terms of what this process is about and how bad it's become. Um, and I, I think the government now doesn't even blink an eye. It's just become their, their modus operandus, their MO in terms of how they do their business. Um, so that's, that's a pretty sad day for Canadian democracy. Uh, now, Mr. Speaker, the bill before us tonight that's being debated, um, Bill S-10, um, that deals with the, uh, the ratification of the Treaty on Cluster Munitions, surely is a, is a very important bill, as the Convention um, is, is very important too. And many of my colleagues tonight have given wonderful uh, descriptions and, and uh, oversight to the importance of this issue and the fact that you know, these cluster munitions, which now stockpile to the amount of something like four billion, which is incredible when you think about it, and the harm that's been done to civilian populations. And we do know uh, that 98 percent of all recorded cluster munitions casualties have been civilians so innocent people. And we know that these cluster munitions, or bomblets as they're sometimes called, they're very small, uh, they can do a tremendous harm, if not killing people, then maiming people for life. And we've seen this in, in uh, many countries. Uh, I think there are about 37 countries that have been engaged in, um, in actions where cluster munitions have been, um, have been in effect. So, so clearly this is a humanitarian catastrophe. And I think Canada historically has had a very good record, uh, the Ottawa Agreement um, on banning landmines. It began in Ottawa. The, the momentum globally came from this country. And so we have a very honorable record on, on some of these issues. And I think Canadians um, have been very proud over the decades to be advocates for nuclear disarmament, for, armament dis uh, for disarmament generally. Um, and certainly when we look at these um, inhuman uh, cluster munitions and the damage that they do, then we can all recognize that a convention um, that would ban their, their operation is something that is critically important to human security, real human security. We live in such a militarized world. We live in a world where con the resolution of conflict often becomes a military uh, 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 resolution. And we've seen a global situation where diplomacy often takes a back seat. And I think that one thing that really worries us is that we now see a government in this country, a conservative government, that seems to have a mindset uh, that is much more, um, uh, that sees military operation uh, as a higher priority. And that we've seen diplomatic 
um, actions and, and, and the role that Canada has played historically as something that becomes more minimal in its approach. And that's very disturbing. So that's why when Canada signed this convention um, in 2008, that was seen as a progressive thing, as a good step, a good step forward. Um, and we know that 111 countries have now signed the convention and 68 have ratified the convention. So once the convention has been signed, it's still up to individual countries to then bring in their own legislation to ratify it, which is what we're debating tonight. Now clearly we would all like to see those remaining countries sign the convention. But what we're debating here tonight is what Canada's position is, what Canada has done and what this government is proposing. And the first thing I would do is echo the comments of my colleague, the member from Winnipeg Centre, who, who asked the uh, obvious question as to why it's taken so incredibly long to have this legislation sitting around. Um, it was signed in 2008. It didn't get tabled in the House of Commons until December 2012, and then it came to the Senate and hung around some more. And yet here we are jamming it through at the last minute at 11 o'clock at night um, with, with really no regular debate. Um, so I think, you know, number one, that becomes very suspect as to what the government's agenda is and the fact that they're not willing to allow this legislation to, to stand the rigorous test that all legislation must live up to. Uh, that's our role, but it's also their role. So, number one, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, put in the debate uh, that we're very concerned about the timing of this bill and how um, they deliberately seem to allow this bill to lapse for so long and now it's being rushed through when presumably not many people are paying attention so late at night. We know that many Canadians are concerned about this issue. One of my colleagues tonight uh, spoke eloquently about the thousands of young people who have signed petitions in support of the convention and expressed their concern about these cluster munitions. So we know that people are very concerned about this issue. And they, you know what? They want to see our government do the best it can do, not the minimal, not the, not the lowest common denominator, but the best effort that we can do. And so when we examine this legislation, and we do look at what other countries are doing, and we look at what experts are saying, then we come to the conclusion that this bill, S10, um, is, is, um, is flawed. It doesn't live up to the convention. And uh, in fact, it, it undermines the convention. And when you, when you hear what others have said who have been very involved in this issue, for example, the former defate negotiator, Mr. Earl Turcotte, who says, quote, the proposed legislation is the worst of any country that has ratified or acceded to the convention on cluster munitions to date. I mean, that's a very strong statement. That's coming from the former negotiator for Canada on the convention. Um, surely the government would listen to this kind of expert advice, but apparently it's being ignored. Then we have the former Australian Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, who says, quote, it's a pity the current Canadian government in relation to cluster munitions does not provide any real lead to the world. Its approach is timid, inadequate, and regressive. So again, Mr. Speaker, I mean, these are very strong and quite astounding words to hear from uh, an ally, a former Prime Minister of Australia, about this Canadian legislation. And many of my colleagues tonight have painstakingly gone through the legislation and showed point by point, but particularly um, section 11, how this legislation um, just, you know, doesn't meet the standard that needs to be met in order to live up to the substance and the principle of the, con of the convention before us. And I, I would quote uh, one other expert source, and that's Minds Action Canada, who actually did do a comparison uh, between Australia, UK, and then looked at uh, a sort of current best practices of various aspects of the bill, including New Zealand and Belgium. And they too come to some analysis that I think should set off the alarm bells for us in terms of what C10, uh, S10 is all about. And what they say is, quote, Canada's legislation allows Canadians to be more proactive in their involvement 
with the use of cluster munitions, which we feel runs counter to the prohibition on assistance. Section 11 seems to go further than any other legislation worldwide in permitting Canadians themselves to use cluster munitions in very specific cases. This is an unacceptable deviation from the spirit and letter of the Convention and from Canada's commitment to lessening the humanitarian impact of, of conflict. Section 11, paragraph 2, regarding uh, Canadians' transport of cluster munitions has no equivalent in the draft Australian legislation or in the UK legislation, again, showing how far Canada's legislation has strayed from the spirit of the Convention on Cluster Munitions. So, Mr. Speaker, that's from, Action, um, from Minds Action Canada. Um, these are not ambiguous words that they are using. Uh, it's not fuzzy. They are stating quite clearly that on their expert analysis, this bill is leaving Canada in a very ambiguous position, will leave our Canadian forces in a very ambiguous and uncertain position. And I, I just think that that's not acceptable. And uh, I'm glad that my colleague just now asked a question as to whether or not the government is actually willing to look at amendments when this bill, as it presumably will, because it's under time allocation, when it goes to committee, whether or not they will consider amendments. Now, the member responded and said, well, if we all agree, there could be an amendment. But again, you know, we get back to this process issue of really a travesty of legislation that goes before a committee and the government is really sort of hell-bent on getting something through and not willing to consider um, amendments that are eminently reasonable and rational and actually seek to improve the legislation. So, I mean, there's many, many examples, hundreds of examples of this happening. But it, with this one, I think we feel particularly bad because it is based on a, on a convention, an international convention. It is based on a great history of how these conventions can help with global security. And so surely at a time like this, um, it's incumbent upon Canadians through our Canadian government to ensure that the legislation that we have is the very best that it can be, not the worst. And so it's very disconcerting to see that according to a number of these experts, that Canada is sort of doing the least that it can do. And in fact, worse than that, it will, it will produce conflict between the convention and what this bill, this so-called ratification. So it's not really a ratification at all. It's something that's contrary to the bill. So, Mr. Speaker, we'll debate this bill as long as we possibly can, and I guess I'm the last speaker. It will go to the committee and we'll do everything that we possibly can at the committee in, with due diligence and in good faith to try and improve this bill. It will come back under time allocation, I have no doubt. And so I guess what we, what we have to do is to really alert Canadians as to just the, the appalling agenda that this Conservative government has, not only in terms of what it does, but also in terms of how it does it, that it, it flies in the face of, of democratic practice. Uh, so I hope that, um, that we will get another opportunity to debate this bill, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.